Welcome to Grace and St. John's Lutheran Churches, bringing you a message from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, presented by Pastor David Schutte. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. A Sermon on 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Paul saves the best for last in his epistle, his first epistle to the Corinthians, here in chapter 15. Uh, this chapter is sometimes called the Great Resurrection Chapter, obviously because it talks so much about the resurrection, more almost than any other place in the Bible. And here we consider the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Earlier in chapter 13, Paul had talked about that uh, famous trio, faith, hope, and love. And so here in chapter 15, Paul is especially addressing the Christian hope of the resurrection. So let's take a closer look at chapter 15 and the great hope that is ours in Christ and his resurrection. Verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul's claim here is that there is a proclamation of Jesus Christ as being raised from the dead. And where was that proclamation first proclaimed? He says earlier in the chapter, verse 1 and 3 and 4, he says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in, and in which you stand. So Paul is going back to the basics, the fundamentals of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Just like any good coach drills the fundamentals, Paul is going back to the basics. What is the gospel all about? For I deliver to you, as of first importance, what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So what Paul is saying here is this is it. This is the gospel. I received it, and I passed it along to you. I didn't add anything to it. I didn't subtract anything from it. This is the gospel that I received from my Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the gospel that I preach to you, namely this, that Christ died for your sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That is to say, all those Old Testament prophecies about Christ, they were pointing forward to Christ dying on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. That's pretty basic gospel stuff, we know that. That Christ was buried. He was buried in the tomb, not his own, but he was buried. And that on the third day, he was raised from the dead, also in accordance with the scriptures. Those same prophecies of Christ's death on the cross also prophesy his resurrection from the dead. And it is this that is being proclaimed, the basics, the nuts and bolts of the gospel especially that Christ was raised from the dead. And yet some of the congregation there in Corinth were denying the resurrection, any resurrection. And a denial of any resurrection leads to, as we'll see, a specific denial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason that people were saying this is because it was the fashionable thing at that time to say the, the kind of Greek philosophy that the Corinthian Christians were coming out of that would be known to them and comfortable in their life is, was a philosophy that said that this stuff here, this material stuff, this is dirty and icky and, and gross and maybe even evil. And when you die, your soul is liberated from the cage that is your body and you, you get to go and be in the spiritual realm and that's good. Who wants to, to mess around down here in this physical created mess of the creation. And so the whole idea of the resurrection was repugnant to that way of thinking because you just escaped from your body. Why would you want a resurrection to go back into your body? And so they 
said that there is no resurrection of the dead based on the kind of things that were cultural, kind of fashionable ways of thinking. And so as Paul said, some say that there is no resurrection of the dead. And this sounds like maybe, ah, you know, I could take it, I could live with the resurrection, I could live without the resurrection, not a big deal. No, as Paul goes on to show, this is a big deal. And he paints a picture, a bleak picture, of what it would look like if there were no resurrection. And so Paul takes us up in the rest of our epistle reading. What if there were no resurrection? Verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Again, to deny the resurrection in general is to deny the specific resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this, as we shall see, is a very big deal. Verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Vanity. Useless. Worthless. Pointless. Our preaching is pointless. Your faith is useless if Christ has not been raised. Verse 15, it gets even worse. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. In other words, the apostle is saying that we apostles, who first brought the gospel to you and planted this church here, we are breaking the second commandment. We are lying in God's name. We're misrepresenting God to you by saying that Christ is raised from the dead when, if it's true that he's not raised from the dead... He goes on to talk about some of the negative consequences in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. The reason your faith would be futile is because God's righteous demands that he has on you would still be on you. And you could not stand in God's presence with that weight of sin around your neck. Remember, when Jesus was crucified for us on the cross. Yes, he took away our sins on the cross, but his resurrection is God's divine stamp of approval that he accepted Jesus' sacrifice for you. So if God didn't raise him from the dead, he didn't accept the sacrifice. Your faith would be in vain, and you would still be in your sins. And even more, those, verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Now, falling asleep here is a euphemism for die. And falling asleep, it has with it this idea of resurrection because what happens when you fall asleep? A little while later, you wake up again, right? So those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, they're about to wake up in the resurrection. But if there is no resurrection, they perish. They're dead. They, they're, they go into oblivion, eternal destruction. If there's no resurrection of the dead... Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They are without hope. Destruction is all that awaits us at the end of life. And especially uh, when we think about the martyrs, those who lay down their life for their faith in Christ, their death was pointless. Many of the apostles would eventually, like the apostle Paul himself, would be martyred for his Christian faith. Or we think about St. Valentine, whose day is tomorrow. St. Valentine, rather than offering a simple pinch of incense to Caesar and saying, Caesar is Lord, not Jesus, but Caesar is Lord, he wouldn't even offer that little pinch of incense, and he said it was better for him to retain his confession of faith in Jesus Christ, and therefore to go into the arena and face and fight the wild beasts and lay down his life. It was better for him to do that than to give up his faith in Jesus Christ. If there is no resurrection of the dead, Paul says, then those who have laid down their life for Christ died a pointless death. And so Paul sums things up here, if there's no resurrection, in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Christians are most to be pitied of all people. Because otherwise, what would be the point of suffering the shame and the scorn 
and the distress, and even the death of the cross of Jesus Christ, and associating with Jesus Christ, it would all be for nothing if there was no resurrection of the dead. You can see that there's a lot at stake here. In other words, the resurrection is really important. As we confessed in, uh, in the Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe that Jesus was raised up on the third day. That's really important. Paul gives us a look into the abyss, the black hole of despair and hopelessness, if there is no resurrection of the dead. But thanks be to God that our reading did not stop there in verse 19. We got that little snippet of verse 20 as well, because Paul shed some light in this dark situation. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Get out the streamers and the party poppers and celebrate. Jesus is raised from the dead. Think about it. After all, why would the apostles proclaim Jesus Christ as raised from the dead? And why would they even risk their lives for that proclamation? If Christ really wasn't raised from the dead. And so as we think about this resurrection, especially Jesus' resurrection, remember, Jesus was very much dead on the cross. If the Romans were good at one thing, they are good at making sure that people die. That's what the crucifixion was all about. That's what that, after Jesus was nailed up there all afternoon, the soldier comes in with a spear through his side, through his heart, just to make sure he was dead. There are four historical facts that prove that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And I would like to consider them with you quickly here this morning. After Jesus' cru crucifixion, we know that Jesus had a proper burial. Remember Joseph of Arimathea, who took Jesus off of the cross and put him in Joseph's own tomb? That's kind of embarrassing, right? I mean, if you um, are going to have a burial, you want a proper burial with your family there and your friends burying you. But Joseph had a complete stranger, even... Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the enemies of Jesus. So Jesus had, yes, he did have a proper burial, but it was not his family and friends that buried him. That's the first fact we know uh, about Jesus' resurrection, is that he was indeed buried in the tomb. The second thing we know, as we confess in the Apostles' Creed, that on the third day, Christ was raised from the dead, the second historical fact we know is that Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his female followers. Now the reason that uh, this is important is because uh, at that time, in the legal system, a man's testimony in court was worth more than a woman's testimony in court. And so if you were going to make up a story about the empty tomb, you wouldn't say that it was the women who discovered the tomb. You'd say, oh, the Apostle Peter, he strode up to the tomb in, in confidence and full assurance. He knew that the resurrection was going to happen. No, it didn't happen that way. It was Mary and the other women who discovered the empty tomb. And so this is what we call the criterion of embarrassment. When studying history, if something is embarrassing for one side, kind of of an argument, you, you're, you're sure that that is true because they had to admit that it happened that way because everyone knew that it happened that way. So the women discover the empty tomb. That's the second fact. The third is this. The resurrection appearances. The appearance of Jesus alive after his death. Paul talks about that earlier in the epistle, starting at 5. And that Jesus appeared to Cephas, that is to Peter. Jesus appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some has fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Jesus appeared after his death alive to many individuals and large groups of people, 
we're told of one gathering of 500 brothers at the same time. And Paul said, hey, most of those guys are still alive. So if you want a first-hand eyewitness account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, go ask one of them. It wasn't just me who saw Jesus. It was all of them at the same time. Some of them have died. Some of them have fallen asleep, I know. But most of them are still alive. So go ask them about Jesus' resurrection. And then four, the fourth fact is this, that Jesus' disciples had the sincere belief in the resurrection of Christ. Remember, Paul and the other apostles, they laid down their life. They were martyred for the proclamation that Jesus was raised from the dead and that he is Lord. I don't know about you, but I would not be willing to die for something that I knew was a lie. But on the other hand, if I knew it was true, I'd be more willing and more likely to lay down my life for something that I knew to be true. The apostles and the other witnesses of the resurrection had a sincere belief that Jesus was raised from the dead and they were willing to die for this confession of faith. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. In view of all of this evidence, Christ's resurrection is sure. That makes all the difference. That means our preaching is not in vain. Your faith is not in vain, but it is very precious, for it holds on and grasps the hope of the resurrection. It holds on to, your faith holds on to, the forgiveness of sins which God gives to you as He accepts Christ's sacrifice for you on the cross, and He puts a stamp of approval on that by raising Jesus from the dead. The apostles were not lying about God, but they were telling the truth. And those who have died in the faith and have laid down their life for their confession of Jesus Christ have truly only fallen asleep. There is coming a day when they will be vindicated and their bodies, their bodies which were violently put to an end, their bodies will be raised up in a perfect glorified body. And they will be honored in the presence of Christ. They died with the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ. We do not need to be pitied as Christians, for we have the hope of the resurrection. Christ has been raised, and He is our head. And where the body goes, where the head goes, the body must soon follow. Now if you'd like to hear more about what this resurrection body will look like, you have to wait until next week's sermon, part two. And now, the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. We thank you for spending this time in God's Word, and invite you to worship with us on Sunday. We are the dual parish, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in Jackson County. Each week we gather for Christian fellowship and receive the abundant gifts our awesome God gives us in His Word and sacraments. Our church locations are listed below.